Good morning. Thanks for attending our second lecture seminar on quantification and system today. My name is Galina and I'm from Celestial Resorts. Today with the guest uh, live on the podium. Uh, more applause for the panel. From the Department of Information Security and Communication Technology at NTU. Um, provided as a postdoc from the Department of Telematics, uh, which is now called um, Information Security and Communication Department. And he held several positions uh, from being a diving instructor and marketing manager to research director at the, the Department of Signal Processing and System Design at Syntax. Um, but I've also consulted the biggest Norwegian telecommunication company and was involved in digital TV solutions for Europe. From 2009, I've been both professor. One of LIFE's uh, main research areas are geo immersive collaboration systems and the development of low latency networks in diverse contexts, for example, in production of audiovisual installation and city plan. Many of these research areas have a lot to do with what we are about to develop and establish in the modern context. Um, already in the 80s and 90s, uh, like I started researching on low latency image and video transmission and gave lectures at Stanford. So, what seems new and innovative to us in some terms um, was uh, thought of quite before our time and uh, remains of the still theory. I know. And therefore, we are pleased to learn more about advanced collaboration spaces and dynamic visions and audio sculptures today. Thank you. Um, I, I am uh, Leif Anna. It's nice to be here to uh, uh, meet you. I'm impressed by what you have uh, obtained here already. And I will uh, tell a little about uh, what I think will come in the near future. Uh, my talk today is divided into two. It's about, uh, part one is advanced collaboration spaces, uh, requirements and possible realizations. And part two will be about uh, the Nidara sculpture. That's a dynamic vision and audio sculpture, uh, combined with a shell senior village on top on, on the Nidara hall. Okay. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, what we see here uh, is an advanced collaboration space. Uh, it's called the uh, Fighting in the Riders. And of course, all surfaces uh, are collaboration surfaces. Uh, this is from 2006, I think it was. Um, <clears throat> The collaboration space, of course, uh, support multi-view. Uh, that means that uh, if, if the riders are standing still and the, this uh, person over here moves over to the other side, other side, he will see the other side of the riders. And we see them from the front now, and the person over there, he can see them from the left side. So, and when it moves, it should be smooth as well. That means we need a lot of views, actually. And uh, <clears throat> a small point here, if we look at the uh, foot of the horse there, you can see it is in this room. If the floor wasn't a collaboration space, then this would have disappeared. That's a small detail, but just uh, something to think of. And we see that uh, his lungs and uh, the part of the horse is in this room, while the other uh, rider is in the room on back. And this is a screen, of course. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, we were not able to uh, demonstrate a system like this. So what we did was that we uh, made a small model with the riders. The riders are actually 10 centimeter high. 
and then we used Photoshop to insert this uh, person uh, uh, over there, uh, quite optimistic, I would say, try to fight these two riders with a chair. To be able to give uh, quality guarantees, uh, then we need to uh, to combine advanced collaboration spaces with what we could call real-time internet. Uh, <clears throat> regarding guarantees, uh, any network, of course, have a limited uh, capacity. And if there are many users and those together offer more traffic than the network could take, then we, of course, have waiting. Or, if it's a reservation system, then uh, we will be rejected. Otherwise, your packets will join some queue and wait. Yeah. Uh, to uh, be able to guarantee something, we have defined several clauses, traffic clauses or quality guarantee clauses, A to E. And the class A is uh, the most advanced, where we can guarantee the real time and uh, where the content is allowed to vary with the uh, traffic in the network. Uh, we do this by letting the network drop packets. The internet can't do that today, actually it's dropped uh, without control. And the routers don't know anything about the uh, application level. So that's a problem with the internet today. So we should introduce that. Uh, this way of uh, controlling uh, the quality is uh, called quality shaping. That's a concept I introduced many years ago. Uh, but in addition to this, uh, the probability for losing very important control package should be very, very low. It should really not happen. But of course, in practice, we know that it will happen once a year, maybe, or so, not more often than that. Uh, class B is a little bit relaxed on the real-time requirements. Uh, package shall be delivered in correct sequence, um, meaning that uh, all packets that we send out should be received in a correct way, and they should uh, come in the same sequence as they were sent. That's class B. Then we come to... Uh, Class C. Uh, there is no real time requirements. We can wait a long time before we become a patient, but the package should be delivered in a correct sequence. This could have, uh, be very important in some cases. Class D, uh, no real time requirements. All packets can be delivered out of sequence. And class E, no real time requirements. Packet can be delivered out of sequence or even lost. Uh, internet today is actually class D and E. That's a fact. Uh, why do we want to have a collaboration spaces plus real time internet? Why not uh, only present internet? Well, we said a few words about that, but. Here we can compare in this uh, very short table. Um, yeah, the, the column on the right side should be internet. Uh, there is some uh, problems with the uh, with, uh, formats here. Um, if I look at real-time guarantees, then the call space plus Reliant uh, has got uh, real-time guarantees. And the only way to do this, as I said, is to actually let the quality of the contents vary with time. That's the only way we can actually guarantee a delay. I don't know of any, uh, any other way after many years. Yes? Can you just uh, explain again? Uh, the call space plus real lint is the first uh, column, and yes. the internet is the second. Right. OK. Yes. Um, yes, and then we come to quality shaping, which I just mentioned, how we can actually form the quality. Um, 
The first system can do that, internet cannot do that. Uh, security in uh, this new system is uh, high. In it, internet, it is quite low. Robustness, uh, we could have defined this concept, but you probably have a feeling of what it is. Robustness uh, in the new system is high. In uh, internet, it's medium. It's quite nice in some cases, you know. In other cases, it's, it's not so good. Openness is maybe the most important here. In this new system, we have a medium uh, openness. In internet, it's very high, actually. And we can say that openness is good for all users, hackers included. Uh, openness uh, makes it easy to introduce new applications, apps, and also to change the operating system or update other software. So this is a nice, nice feature for that. But as you said, it is a disaster for security. Just remember the case with North Hydro uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now they are producing at a much lower rate, and they also have used uh, three, four hundred million kroner on finding out of this. So it's uh, actually a di disaster for them. Another good thing with openness is that all of us can have access. Not only those can pay a lot of money for access. That's a good thing also. So this is uh, actually about uh, balancing the openness against security and other quality factors. Yeah, this is an example of a two-dimensional collaboration space. It is about the conduction of choirs. Uh, this is a picture from, uh, I think it was from 2012. It was a master student uh, of mine that uh, was conducting some uh, research on this conduction of fires. Um, this lab uh, was uh, is just opposite to my office, so it's very short distances, no delays and things like that, which are problematic. We found a lot of interesting things, and you may find and read this uh, thesis if you like. Uh, we found that the 60 hertz frame rate is actually too low for this case because the, the hand movements of the conductor was blurry. So we could not uh, really follow them very sharply. So we need uh, at least 120 frames per second for this. And um, there are also other things that we discovered, of course, but that's the most important that we need to increase the frame rate. And then we are not talking about the frame rates, so the, the update rate, so screens, we are talking about the input update rate, actually. Yeah, to the screen. Well, we have no delays, as I said, because uh, this lab is quite to my office, so uh, we, don't, we didn't uh, look into that problem. But it was an okay um, experience. We learned a lot about uh, network collaborations. Uh, this is uh, from a few years earlier. Um, it's an example of a 3D uh, collaboration space at its uh, virtual working lounge. As we see in the yellow there, it should be a near natural virtual collaboration. That means the two students there should feel they were sitting in the same room and having lunch and discussing a topic. Um, of course, this uh, image is also constructed. Um, they're actually sitting at the same table in the same room. <laughs> and uh, then I used Photoshop to fix the screen and the background afterwards. But that's how we have to do it, to make models and demonstrate things. Then comes naturally the question, what are the requirements to video change and also sound change, so change of course? Uh, here we uh, 
we start with uh, showing uh, the existing system in the upper part, and we have the future system in the lower part of the slide. And we are talking about the optical end-to-end -end delay because this is very important. There are, of course, a lot of other requirements which we don't mention here. Uh, we see that today we have a few cameras, maybe 60 frames per second, and that means, uh, on average if, average, if we think of uh, the camera as a sampling device, it uh, samples with 60 frames per second, and it takes it mean eight milliseconds for each new image. That means we, we, we lose a lot of fast movements in between. That's why uh, the conducting was not successful. Um, to transfer from the camera, compress and other processing, you may need 30 milliseconds today. And when it comes to the network, we can assume 15 milliseconds between Oslo and Trondheim. It's probably a little shorter than that already with the Uninet. But with the internet, generally, I know from uh, my office to my home, it's uh, 25 milliseconds already. So that's quite slow. Then comes to, uh, we come to the um, receiving part, and uh, there is also transfer to the screen, the compression process and so on takes 30 milliseconds. And today we have to use two or three displays. 60 frames per second is uh, eight millisecond mean delay. In the future, we uh, will go so look at the lower part of this slide. Go to 240 frames per second, uh, reducing the mean delay for sampling the scene to two milliseconds about. And we will have a large number of cameras integrated into the displays. The transfer and the compressing and the processing will take shorter time, take maybe five milliseconds. This is possible by using not a PC software, but using specialized hardware. So this is possible. Uh, Uninet may, um, improve a little bit, let's say 10 milliseconds, or even lower. And then uh, on the receiving side, we will also reduce the processing time down to 5 milliseconds. And we will have a displays that uh, shows uh, the uh, content immediately when it comes in, not any storing or delaying inside the equipment as we have today. It will be shown immediately uh, where it should be addressed on the screen. We will have, we will have uh, 20 adaptive views or more, and all services will be multi-view displays. So that's the future. Uh, but for, for ordinary meetings, of course, 100 or, or 200 milliseconds delay is quite nice. The Tan Tanberg or Cisco equipment, uh, uh, last time I visited them, uh, took 20 milliseconds. We tried to, uh, to count from several places, and that was quite OK. And I asked them then to clap together. I asked the marketing director in the other end to clap together. Maybe he couldn't do that in two other milliseconds, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> so and for rhythmic uh, music, uh, we should have 20 milliseconds uh, delay for video and not more than 10 milliseconds delay for audio. I think that's uh, what we have experienced. Uh, then I will go a little bit, uh, but not in much detail, but a little bit, so you can have a feeling of what this could be uh, look like uh, in the future. Here we have an um, example of a collaboration space quite small, 3 by 4.5 by 3.5 meters. But all six services are of the collaboration service, uh, are collaboration services with multi-view cameras and displays. Um, the idea is that this uh, collaboration space could be built with a small unit uh, called CSBV, called Space Building Block. And this can uh, cover a certain part of the room. We have suggested that it, uh, 
could cover, cover three sectors, each of 50 degrees or so. And it should be so that uh, the cameras are positioned with the eye distance, which, which is about 6.5 centimeters. Uh, the lens size, now we come into this detail, should be small, uh, one millimeter or so. Maybe even smaller than that. So this, uh, this small room is for maybe, it could be an office or a, a small room we use to, to collaborate, uh, playing together or something. Uh, with two, three persons, maybe. Then we have a look at a, a somewhat bigger collaboration space. It's a travel bureau, actually. Uh, I, I should have uh, made a fine drawing of this, but I haven't done that yet. So we have to read the text and try to understand. So the collaboration space A is a travel bureau. Marketing and selling boat trips to the fjords of Norway. Uh, collaboration space B are the remote customers at UBS. The surroundings in call space A can be shot from a third place. Let it be in a stunning view of the waterfalls of the Hadegi Fjord. Shot live from a tourist ship passing by. The travel bureau seems to be moved to the deck of the ship. That should be the feeling in the travel bureau. Customers in the color Base B, that's us, have face-to-face -face contact with the salespersons in the collaboration space A, and also see the background from the fjord on our uh, screens. Uh, it's very important to have multi-view and views from walls, ceiling, and floor. Uh, this is uh, definitely very important in this case. Um, Maybe uh, an airplane is passing our, our, our heads, then we should see it in, in the, our ear. And maybe we are looking down from the, the ship, and then we should, may see a small boat passing by. We should also see that through the wall, or through the, the floor. Um, this, of course, should have very high quality, visual quality, and also sound. And the customers in uh, collaboration space B, that's us, uh, we should feel it as if we were present on this tourist ship. We could hardly notice any difference. We are not there yet, <laughs> of course. Um, and we should look at the beautiful waterfalls and listening to the marvelous sounds around us there. It's a nice trip, by the way. Important question? Yes? How, uh, how many years do you think it takes to be there? Well, I, I have uh, many times said 10 years, but uh, it <laughs> seems to be more 20th, maybe more realistic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it uh, happens uh, quite fast, and other times. Uh, and it improves all the time. That's a good thing. I mean, we have to start with what we have got. <coughs> yes? Uh, for how long have you thought about the example that you just talked about? When was uh, that? I think it's maybe uh, not ten years, but seven, eight years since I, I I wrote this down. So seven, eight years ago, did you think ten years? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so three years. <laughs> yeah, I I thought <laughs> right, it could be a little bit faster, but uh, it hasn't <laughs> happened yet, as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's have a short look into uh, how these uh, small building blocks could be realized. It's a small size, 6.5 centimeters by 13 centimeters. And uh, there is not uh, many, this is actually optical pixels. Uh, there will be, uh, for one pixel, there will be 20 views at least. So the, this is not the normal screen uh, considerations. But uh, <coughs> let us start with uh, this cut through side view unit here. There we have uh, suggested uh, 
a lens called the Green Lens Array on the left side. Uh, this green lens uh, is gradient index. Uh, that is a special type of uh, lens, actually, that is cut out of uh, a cylinder of plastic or some small pieces. And they could uh, be stacked together. But that's not uh, the way to do it. Uh, but let's come back to that. Uh, we also um, have a laser scanner over on the right side, which uh, it's an RGB of three colors, which can uh, scan over all the lenses and also make 20 views for each lens. We come back to that as well. Uh, we have some uh, display and networking processors on the back wall here, and we have some uh, connectors. Um, on the other side, we have a cut through top view. Uh, it's actually, uh, oh, there is a problem with this uh, formatting again. Um, it's two views, uh, and uh, two units, sorry, uh, on the right hand side. We have the green lens array, and we also have the optics for the camera just in the upper uh, part of it. And we see the lasers, and so on. Uh, so, of course, we can uh, build any kind of space or room with uh, such units. They are not cheap to start with, but with uh, volume production and efficient production methods, this could be uh, a quite nice unit to a low price and very easy to stack together. And, uh, well, the processing and the controlling of this uh, hardware and software is not easy, but it, it can be done in principle. Uh, let's show a few details here. Uh, <clears throat> This is an illustration of how we can use a, a micro, -electro micro electronic uh, mechanical system, which is actually an integrated circuit with a mirror that can be tilted over two axes. And if we use a laser, as we mentioned, to point to this mirror, we can draw uh, a screen uh, like this. So that's what uh, an important component that can be used. And this is available. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel any, any time we are doing new things. Uh, this is a real system uh, made by a company called Microvision. It's called Pico P Display Engine. And, uh, in the left corner, we see that there's a combiner for combini combining three lasers, um, red, green, and blue lasers, and pointing to that, uh, that uh, mirror, which we just talked about. And if you are controlling this mirror with uh, some electronic devices and also input some control for the intensity of these three colors, then we can draw this. Uh, this image on the screen there. Uh, a product they have is uh, quite small and includes uh, this uh, mirror and also a few other parts. And it's so small that it could be introduced into a mobile phone. Well, it's a little bit old, this one, but, uh, but uh, in principle or in very, very small projectors. Uh, they have done this, and if you look at the um, net, you can find more about uh, their technique. It's quite, it's quite good quality as well. So, yeah, let's have a short look into uh, <coughs> uh, how these lenses are made. We mentioned these uh, green lenses, which could be used. And it could also be plastic lenses, an array of lenses as suggested. Uh, on the next slide, we will have a look at how this is realized. But we see that we have the lens array on the left side, and we have the RGB laser scanner to point to all these these uh, elements. 
uh, we show the front of this unit and we see that on the, on the left side we have placed uh, a lot of cameras downwards. Uh, this is one way of using it. It could be done in other ways, which I looked a little bit into. Um, but let's say a few words about this uh, lens array here. It could be realized uh, using a type of plastic sheet, and you can dope this plastic sheet to form each small lens unit. Uh, that's uh, possible uh, today. Um, I know there is a University in Boulder in uh, Colorado, US, that uh, have uh, looked a little bit at this. We had some talks about it uh, a couple of years ago. So they can, in principle, do this. Uh, other ways, uh, it could be also more mechanical work to decide this. Um, we should also mention that uh, instead of having the cameras down one side, we can make it uh, sort of an L in the corner. I will come back to that. I looked a little bit into that. So then uh, we have the uh, details of uh, the lens array. We see that uh, the laser can scan. When it hits uh, the inside of this lens, it will be Reflect, you know that, uh, remember from uh, from Vietrigon uh, school, I think, uh, how this was done. Uh, if you have a lens, uh, it light errors it will be deflected. And uh, we have suggested that uh, we can see that they are spread out a little bit. And uh, we can, uh, let's say, have 20 different rays uh, in uh, for one, one optical lens. That means we have uh, 20 views for uh, each uh, small lens uh, uh, unit. So this is one way of doing it. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, this, can, uh, this lens can be machined or molded even. Uh, that's possible. I talked to uh, the guys working with such things at another department at uh, NTNU, and they said they could do this. Uh, they hadn't done it before, but it was possible. So there are many ways to, uh, to do this. And uh, just to say a few words about production of it, uh, uh, of course, there will be some, um, uh, well, one, one cell will not be exactly like the other one. But this could be adjusted uh, by measurements and also electronic control of, of the lasers. Then we could, we could uh, take care of, uh, of the spread in production for those lenses. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the size of each element could be one millimeter or even smaller. But there is, uh, when we know that when we try to shoot light, through small holes, then we get a diffraction problem. That's uh, part of uh, optical physics, which uh, shows that uh, if we have a very small hole or a very small uh, lens, and we try to uh, image uh, just a point source in the room, it will be uh, spread out on the, on the imager. And there will be one spot of light, and there are some rings around as well. So that's a diffraction pro problem. That's a lot of mathematics to show that's uh, true, but we can also see it in the practical life that it will be like that. So small lenses are a problem. Yeah, here is another. Uh, we don't have to say very much about this, I think. Uh, Uh, it's uh, suggested uh, a lot of small green lenses uh, that are put together to make the area that's too expensive. They're quite expensive, so the green lenses are still the most uh, expensive part of this. Uh, the laser scanners are not that expensive anymore. They're becoming uh, cheaper. And uh, also the hardware used inside here is not expensive at all. So uh, we have to, uh, 
to do something with the green that's very to reduce the prices. That's the main, main problem, I think. Um, here we have the camera part, which we saw in the upper corner. Uh, we see that uh, this is a uh, green lens uh, where the light is coming in from the scene. And we have a type of a combiner or uh, and, uh, uh, something that can uh, lead the, the light rays down to the combiner, a sensor and optics. We are not going into details, but in, in principle, these uh, techniques or technology is available. And we need, of course, some image processing as well. So this could be realized. Um, I haven't seen that uh, anybody has done it yet, but I've looked so much in it that, that I can say that it is uh, possible, um, probably. So one question. So yep. is it possible to patent this concept? Yeah, or how actually, do you do I, I should have done that, uh, but no, I retired, so I don't. <laughs> but what would be the so? I mean, this idea, how, yeah, what would be the, the steps then to uh, kind of define it conceptually and then... Well, um, what, what we did a uh, few years ago, we tried to, uh, to uh, send an application to an EU project on it. Uh, but uh, I think they thought it was too uh, far away from the market, really. It was too advanced for what we applied for, <laughs> at least. So that was, uh, but that's uh, what we have to live with uh, when we are thinking 10, 20 years ahead. But of course, uh, just now there are no others working with this. So, um, uh, because at my department, uh, I was the only one working with this. Uh, but they were working with similar things, uh, maybe in the, the neighboring department. Uh, but um, they didn't have uh, time and the right persons to follow it up, so it's not uh, it's standing still for the time being. And uh, when you ask about uh, patents, uh, Samsung really, one year ago, they got a patent for showing uh, cameras and things like that under the throat glass or the throat display. So uh, they got the patent for this. Uh, the idea is much older than uh, what they were thinking of, and more complex as well. So or, you're right, we could uh, have, uh, have patents for this. You, you will part participate? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also, I guess, the, with the openness, patenting, I guess also there is this uh, conversation, because it's good also to offer it as an open open source space yeah. to explore. So I guess also there's this debate, what mm -hmm. should be patent, what not. Yeah. yeah. Well, there is an, uh, an office at the TTO, that I knew that could uh, have allocated mm -hmm. at it, of course. Maybe I should do that. OK. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much we should talk about uh, green lenses, but uh, here's a focusing uh, lens. Uh, it, this behaves exactly like a, an ordinary uh, convex lens, actually. So if we have an uh, image, this arrow I on the right side, it's uh, shown on the out other side as uh, the out image. And we see that uh, we have the focal lengths and uh, everything, you know, what ordinary lenses. And uh, the only difference that instead of have a geometric uh, type of glass, we uh, have a, a refraction uh, index that varies through this, uh, this small uh, cut from a, a rod, plastic rod. So on, on the right hand side, we see the end, that's the refraction index, varies with x, as the green line shows us. This means that if we input parallel light from this side, then they will uh, meet at a point at the other side, that's the focal point. 
or if you do the opposite with the light uh, point source that spreads out in all directions uh, in the focal point, it will come out as parallel lights on the other side. So that's optic. And the, this is an, uh, an uh, application that is spread out all over the world. Uh, an endoscope is used for looking inside our body, or it could be used for looking inside the um, uh, motors or various kites or other places where you can't see very well from outside. Just have a small hole and you can put in. So um, you see that the technology is already there. Well, you might have uh, asked yourself, does not uh, this uh, require a very high data rate? And that's true. Uh, what we see in the networks today, it's very small compared to what we need here. Uh, we need 20 views for continuity, as you mentioned. And this, this means that if we look at the, one of the small collaboration spaces which we presented, then we need more than 1,000 views inside there. In all. And we need an update rate of uh, cameras and screens uh, up to 120 hertz. This means that the, the, the rate per view, the data rate per view, will be 28 gigabits per second. And for the whole uh, space, it will be 28 terabits per second. Hmm. There is no <laughs> uh, network that can uh, copy that today. Uh, Fiber optics have the potential for those, uh, but the, the, the electronics in it cannot cope with it yet. But it's improving all the time. What we can do then um, to try to reduce the data rates? Um, we can try to detect what the viewers focus on, and then if I'm the only person in the room uh, and I am looking at uh, this field over there, then uh, a system will find out that I'm talking also on that and send information only on that view. The person standing on, in this distance from me will not see this uh, shift. But that will reduce the amount of data a lot. Um, so that's one thing. It uh, doesn't help if the room is filled with persons, then we have to, uh, but most of you are looking this way, so that means we need to, uh, have used from this side, but not from the other side. Uh, I could look at uh, the shield, and you can look at uh, all details on this side. <laughs> uh, so that would help. We could also try to decide uh, what is what are the important objects in the room and non-important objects. And the non-important objects we could uh, send with send with a lower resolution. Uh, both in the time and space. So that would uh, help a lot. There are a lot of other tricks as well we could uh, apply to this. So maybe we could uh, come closer to 28 gigabits per second most of the time. Uh, so we could, uh, but at, if we want to uh, uh, transfer all information at the same time, then we have a problem with 28 terabits per second, of course. Um, so we have to reduce uh, our requirements a little bit, I think, or increase the capacities. Yeah, um, we could say a little bit about cameras. Um, popular cameras have images that uh, are cheap and they uh, utilize only one third of the incoming light through the lenses and uh, they reduce the spatial resolution a lot. Uh, so our uh, cheap uh, cameras, popular cameras, are not that good. Uh, the mobile phone is uh, quite okay, the camera on this is quite nice, but um, if I'm trying to shoot images in the evening, and there are a dark uh, street, but some uh, lights up, then we see that the lights will uh, saturate uh, this part of the image, and we don't see what is in, in the dark parts. So that's uh, about the dynamics of, uh, of the system. It's not good enough. 
so a professional like uh, camera, the video camera, it would be much better than this on that, of course. But for taking uh, uh, images in good light in a situation like this, for example, it's perfect. It's a wide angle lens and you can uh, shoot everybody at the same time in a room like this. Yeah, um, we could uh, do something to separate uh, the three colors, and that's done in the more expensive cameras. That improves the performance and also the price. But the good thing is that uh, the eye and our brain is like that. We are more, much more sensitive to luminance, uh, the, the black, gray, white light, than the colors. So that's a good thing. And um, also that actually uh, blue and red are much less sensitive than the green color. That's normally not taken into account anywhere, but that's a fact. So what we could do then is to have one camera with a large dynamic range that can take the black and the very white spots at the same time and have a high spatial and temporal resolution. A spatial is uh, in the room and the temporal is the time, how many frames per second, for the luminance. And in addition to that, we could look at frames coming after each other, and we don't send uh, all the information, we just send the difference information. That's uh, very effective if we have uh, static scenes. If nothing changes, then we don't have to send anything just use the old one. Um, and we use another camera for colors, which, um, which is designed to be good to uh, take good colors rather than light. Uh, it could have a lower dynamic range and a lower spatial and temporal resolution, and also use the same techniques, sending difference between, differences between frames. So that's um, a way to do it. And we can send this in two different streams, one uh, high rate streams for the luminance and a low rate stream for, uh, for the colors. And this has been done uh, in several systems before. Uh, do you think, it, yeah? I, I, so we, uh, are, do you guys need a break or? Oslo, are you okay? Because we have 45 minutes. Uh, do you want a break, or shall we maybe after the when we move on to the audiovisual um, installation part? Um, well, I, I I need five minutes maybe or so, but we can. I could uh, maybe go through. I have a few two three slides again. Yeah. I could go through that and we can have a break. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, as I said, uh, this uh, luminance and the RGB techniques are uh, not new. So separating lum luminance and colors uh, have been done in uh, the old TV. We started with black and white TV and we added colors afterwards. And also these uh, more cheap uh, video camcorders also use a similar princi principle with uh, separating Luminance from colors. Um, yeah, there's various, various sensors. We don't have to say much about that. Uh, but uh, the old one, CCD, has a little better quality than the CMOS, but it's much more expensive. So, so it's uh, yeah, we don't uh, have to say much about that. Uh, an example of this uh, LRGB technique is uh, when uh, they try to take good images of uh, distant uh, faint galaxies. Uh, if you look at uh, it, uh, you will just see some light and you don't know what it is uh, in any way. What we can do then is to shoot a lot of separate L images and a lot of uh, RGB images, and then they can process this together afterwards. Uh, it can be shown, and also the practice show, shows that the, the noise is then reduced a lot. So the quality uh, is becoming much better. 
uh, build some uh, other type of uh, image processing. We can also uh, improve the edges of objects in the, in the image. So uh, it looks quite nice. That we have tried in the lab, and also some students at the Stella is in a, in a lab, and it works quite well back in time. Yeah, uh, then we come to the problem of, uh, of uh, how to, uh, to include the cameras into the display. That's, uh, of course, uh, not simple, but it's possible. Then we can uh, use, I, I suggested that we have several small lenses uh, for the cameras. And on one side, we could have an L, as I mentioned also. Um, but uh, we should remember that uh, it's uh, actually uh, the camera optics that uh, shape the light energy onto the sensor. Uh, this means that the, the optics should be matched with the imager. Uh, when we design cameras. Uh, so it's not uh, good if the lens is uh, fabulous and uh, the imaging chip is bad, then we get a very bad result. And um, it's actually better that the lens is uh, not that good and the imager is better. But in any case, they should match. Um, we have uh, the possibility to go into some theory. I don't think it's necessary, actually, but you, you should uh, remember this, um, what is called the modulation transfer function for uh, an optical system or for an imager as well. Uh, there is uh, some explanation of it on, uh, on this uh, link here. Um, but uh, I don't think we should go too much into detail. We should just remember that uh, this defines the contrast for each uh, spatial frequency and also the, the resolution, the cutoff frequency for the uh, for an image. This um, uh, this uh, is uh, very important for uh, for the quality for any optical system for cameras um, everything. Uh, if you are interested, you could look a little bit more into that, but we don't uh, go further. I just give some links. Uh, you will see uh, immediately, uh, at least on the first, uh, what is actually going on, I think. Yeah. Yeah, in some cases, uh, a very big uh, aperture is uh, impractically large. An example of that is, for example, these telescopes I send out uh, uh, into space, the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be uh, hopefully sent up in uh, uh, 2021, um, is an example. It's quite big. Uh, it's not it, it's not lenses, but it's uh, mirrors. It's too big to be uh, sent up in one unit, so they divide this into uh, hexagons or 18 smaller hexagons, which is actually. Uh, Stacked together when it's set after it has been set up. So that's an example of a, of a sparse aperture. But uh, in our case, uh, sparse aperture is uh, putting uh, small lenses at various places into the display. That's uh, our problem. And um, uh, if we have, uh, let's say, one millimeter, then we get uh, these diffraction problems, as I mentioned. A spot in the scene will not, or a point in the scene will not be a point on the image, it will be a spot with some rays. Um, and it's important also, as they did with this, uh, this uh, space telescope, they put these uh, units together as uh, dense as they can. Then uh, the area of the, the smaller apertures will be uh, not much smaller than uh, the whole, if you had built it with a whole uh, unit. Um, what uh, that happens uh, if uh, I have tried this? Uh, if we put five or seven small cameras into the corner of this uh, building unit, which I presented, then uh, if you use only one uh, lens of this, 
you can't even see what the, the, the image is about. But if you use Spine and you process in a, in a good way, it's a lot of processing, you, you can run it on a PC actually. Then, uh, then you, it comes quite nice, just with five small holes. So that's uh, quite amazing. But that's uh, what we said about this theoretical uh, problem we had. We have to study this and the distance and the holes have to be placed in exact places. So uh, this is about waves. Light is uh, partly particles, but it's all waves. And, uh, it's like waves on uh, water. We see that they meet and they disrupt and they add together a lot of problems. Uh, it's the same with this light. Yeah, I'm not going to say more about that. So then I have uh, finished part one, and then we can take a five minutes break if you like. Great. Yeah. We're back uh, for the second part of the presentation. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, then we uh, start on part two, which is about the Nidar uh, sculpture. This is a dynamic vision and audio sculpture combined with a senior village on top of uh, the existing Nidar Hall. Uh, first, uh, a little bit of background for this. Um, uh, Nidare Hallen is a multi-purpose hall for sports, concerts, uh, exhibitions, uh, or any other activities, in fact. And uh, in 2018, the Trondheim City Council decided to replace the old hall with a bigger hall. Of course, in such a case, there are many pros and cons, and uh, the debate in the newspaper paper were quite heated from time to time. But as I would uh, argue, the, this decision was not a um, disaster, because the outer appearance can be enriched at the time. Uh, just take a look at the develop development of the Basilica di San Marco in Venezia. Here we have that. Uh, by uh, 1100, it looks like the upper image there, quite nice, of course. But after uh, some time, they have um, uh, changed the outer decor and also the interior, of course, many times. And now it's stunning and outstanding, uh, just uh, gorgeous, I think. Uh, but the main uh, structure of the building has been maintained. So uh, all these uh, forms, uh, basic forms, are still inside the new decor. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, with uh, this in mind, uh, it costs a little bit, of course. <laughs> with this in mind, what can we do with the uh, Nidare Hall? That's the question. But first, we will see uh, look a little bit into uh, some uh, city planning technologies, which we can combine to utilize this Nidarohallen uh, both as a sculpture and, uh, and uh, a village for, for the elderly. So that's the intention. So we, we, we first go this very fast. <clears throat> Uh, we see down, this is uh, actually a kind of a long tunnel built over the Elgesäter Gate in Trondheim. And we see down there that uh, we have uh, cars uh, that are actually moving out from Elgesäter Gate to the side streets. Uh, upper, uh, here we have uh, sun radiation and inside a double glass or uh, some plastic or whatever, we put uh, voltaic cells, that's solar panels, that uh, can be adjusted uh, so they can maximize the irradiation from the sun and things like that. And what we do is then to produce electricity uh, from the sun and we also have to 
we know that uh, these uh, panels uh, they produce 20% electricity and 80% uh, of heat. So uh, if we can utilize this heat as well, then it's uh, quite nice. And uh, when we cool down the panels, they are more efficient when, uh, or than the, when they are hot. So that's a good thing. So we let this uh, air circulate, hot air coming down and, and going into some heat exchanger which can uh, warm up the uh, inside of this tunnel. And we can also, if you like, produce hydrogen and store. But we can also directly store the, uh, the excessive heat in a heat reservoir down there. And uh, when the sun is down and it's cold outside, we can uh, just fetch back the heated water or whatever it is from the heat reservoir. And uh, heat up the buildings in the middle um, in the night. And when uh, the um, hot air flow is, is uh, reduced, the temperature is reduced, and it goes back again, and it's heated up, uh, goes uh, around. So this is uh, the basic uh, principle. So actually, this, um, this is a local power plant that can uh, have no emission or anything. It is self-sufficient, and it produces a climate like that of the Canary Island all the year round. That means also building blocks in the middle can be quite cheap. You have to uh, isolate for sound and things like that, but not for heat and uh, no moisture, rain or anything. So the buildings inside can be quite cheap, actually. Much cheaper than the passive houses built today. So this is another way of thinking uh, uh, of building. Uh, this could be built over any, any existing building or over any street in any town, anywhere. So um, it's not a new technology, actually. I, the first building I saw was in Milano. That's from 1911 that has glass uh, over the street. And there are a lot of them here in Trondheim uh, also, and other cities. Uh, but it's about uh, combining technologies in a new way, this. And uh, why I am looking into this is that these voltaic uh, or solar cell panels can also be used to form a sculpture. That's uh, why I'm presenting this. And um, also building a house for the elderly uh, or a village for the elderly is uh, combined with this sculpture. That's, uh, that's also a good thing. And uh, of course, these solar cells, uh, they, uh, they produce energy on one side. And if we put a display on the back side, and these are controllable in the space, then we can have quite much fun. So uh, here is uh, actually, uh, this is an uh, image shot from uh, El Elvegata. Uh, I don't know if you know where it is, but it's one side uh, of Nidarholm, and it's uh, now uh, hided behind these white surfaces. And inside there is, uh, first of all, the hole itself, and we have this... Uh, this uh, Shell Senior village inside here, and uh, these surfaces can be used as a sculpture. And of course, we also need sound for this. And uh, in a while, I will say how I will produce the sound, uh, actually, from, uh, from what we see here. First, uh, the interior of the hall can be built up as a collaboration surface, so we can um, collaborate with other big venues. Um, this was actually, this image is from, uh, I participated in the staging an opera called Tora Porimol a few years ago, and um, 
in that case, I, I draw this uh, scene. It wasn't used like this, but this was one of the proposals. So we could do this in the, the Nidaro Hall, build up a scene and also have a collaboration surfaces all around, like this. And uh, a natural uh, partner for this um, type of uh, collaboration space could be this. This was, uh, I published this in uh, RSM News uh, three, four, four years ago or so. Um, and this was actually built on a, a platform floating on the fjord. You could uh, drive around with it. But it's uh, actually a combination of a sculpture and a culture, cultural uh, house, uh, which uh, you can use for anything. You can combine this with light uh, displays, but also water art, of course, you have a lot of water around it. So this could be a good uh, cooperating partner for, for this uh, other space in Nidarehalm. And we could also use, uh, of course, uh, Olavshalm, and we can use uh, uh, Nidaros uh, Cathedral. Uh, also in this cooperation. So it's a uh, lot of possibilities here. And uh, these uh, are examples of, uh, of uh, quite big uh, collaboration spaces. Well, this we have seen before, uh, but this will also be the, the requirement for the collaboration spaces built up in the hall. So um, just remember that we need to uh, reduce the uh, video delay to 20 milliseconds and the sound delay down to 10 milliseconds and then we are happy and have a lot of cameras and a lot of displays all over. Yeah, when it comes to uh, existing equipment, you, uh, you know a lot about that and we are actually using a lot of it uh, today. Uh, the LOLA system, for example, is what we are using here. And uh, there are many options uh, when it comes to existing 2D uh, video conferencing and telepresence. I have some references. It's in this last paper I sent to you, so you can uh, have a look at that and find the references. Uh, also, the best video conferencing services uh, the, this year it's also presented uh, uh, on the net. So just have a look. And there are, of course, a lot of PC-based software, many options. And it's quite nice for many users. Um, not for rhythmic music, but for uh, ordinary meetings, it's just fine. Uh, here's a few words about the sound. You also know this. The Dante system is uh, it was designed in Australia some years ago. And it's quite nice uh, piece of work. Uh, it is uh, ultra low latency digital audio over IP and Ethernet. They use one gigabit per second network capacity uh, and provide uh, more than thousand be by direct no channels. The sampling could be 48 or even up to 192 kilohertz. And uh, the, each sample would be 24 bits. The minimum latency, uh, they say, is uh, 150 microseconds. That's uh, quite true. But uh, this means that they are not connected to a network that connect to uh, to boards directly to each other, then you obtain that delay. Uh, of course, when you have uh, various routers in the system, you could add a millisecond or so for each router. And uh, uh, But still, I know uh, we have seen here in Trondheim that uh, delays could be quite nice in uh, less than 10 milliseconds. And I'm not sure what the delay to Oslo is here on the, the audio, but it's less than 10, I think, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. There are also several competitors uh, to uh, the Dante system. You can uh, look at these references uh, when you read this uh, paper I mentioned. Yeah, then we uh, go further with the sculpture. 
Here is uh, another view. It's from the opposite side. We see that the river is uh, just uh, on three sides of Nidarholm. And uh, it could look like this uh, from, uh, from uh, a little higher up. And we see these surfaces could be used for a lot of interesting things. Uh, the inside, of course, for the uh, senior people uh, should uh, lead to many activities. It could be networked collaborations, of course, as the most natural. 15 minutes back, yes, fine. And uh, such as virtual dinners, uh, virtual wine testing with some experts, uh, and remote language courses, you name it. It's a lot of possibilities. Yeah, here is again um, the sculpture zoomed in from Elvegata from the opposite side. And uh, now it's in the night and we see that there are some nice colors, which uh, I, I personally think this is a quite nice view rather than what we see today. Well, the, the building is quite high, but it's not very dominating uh, in any case. Um, so, um, but it, a nicer view would be something like that. And as I mentioned, uh, the uh, solar panels inside here can be turned uh, out so they can give uh, colors like this. In the, in the night, or when they don't produce uh, solar energy. Yeah. Well, then uh, I um, come to how we uh, generate sound. And um, I have suggested that uh, we. Um, should uh, produce sound from uh, from vision, but uh, it could be there are numerous ways you can do this, and uh, you can uh, have music and vision totally independent, for example, that's possible, and or they could be entirely synchronized. And we can uh, have music generated from vision, but also the opposite, we can generate vision from music. So there are a lot of uh, possibilities. And that it comes to external triggers, interactive triggers, uh, triggered by people passing by, that is well known. Uh, signals from the net, uh, live performances, measured data, uh, water tank temperature versus ambient temperature, that's uh, some measurement I do at home for the time being. We can uh, fetch signals from nature, take images of the rings of Saturn, for example. There are many, many possibilities. But we will focus on generating music from the vision from the Nidaro sculpture. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to sound design and uh, music from vision, then just repeat this, that sonification is the process of generating sound from data. And in our case, uh, we use changes in images. Uh, the sound design could be inspired by film or opera. In that case, uh, the music is part of uh, some bigger art uh, uh, presentation. And uh, it's often used to underscore and strengthen the, the total experience uh, we, uh, we have. So there are also uh, what role the sound should play is uh, also uh, can vary from time to time. Yeah, changes in uh, images uh, or video, they can be spatial or temporal. Um, and uh, the, if we look at the intensity of uh, certain pixels, or we can look at difference in intensity from one frame for one pixel in one frame to the next. That's a rate of change measure. Um, but uh, not to overload our processing equipment, we can uh, sort out a few pixels we follow through a video. 
And then we see what happens. In our case, if we assume that images have, have the RGB format somehow, then we can uh, sort out uh, six variables. It's red, uh, the intensity of a red pixel or a set of red pixels. And we can have a change from one frame to the next for the same pixels. And we can do the same for green and also for blue. Then we have six variables as input to our music, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Uh, what, we, what I have done, uh, I'm quite open to this, so I just use my fantasy and see what uh, happens uh, in a while. And um, I have uh, used some if-then-else uh, rules, which is uh, quite normal in programming, and uh, used that to uh, set up uh, certain rules for what this should sound like. Uh, so uh, I have... Uh, found a set of pixels, a subset of pixels from one image to the next, which I measured. And uh, then the difference could be uh, negative or positive, so I have divided into three intervals, strong negative, medium, and strong positive. So, to make it simple. It becomes complicated enough very fast when you try to produce music. Um, I have used three music instruments. Um, and I have a flute for the melody, I think, and I have uh, bassoons, two or three bassoons for uh, making chords. And I have drums, which are not really, I have used my own synth where I can play and uh, make some rhythmic uh, things. I just uh, made a uh, record of that and added. Uh, the melody uses the Dorian D scale uh, with a tonic D. And I use only three chords, D, A, and G, uh, with these uh, tonic tones, but uh, I uh, avoid the thirds, because the thirds de decides if this is minor or major chords, and I uh, avoid that, and I use only the fifth. So that means uh, when you hear only these two tones, you can't de really decide what this is, but when the melody then comes, that then we get uh, some uh, fancy uh, chords, which... <laughs> Uh, that was not the intention, maybe, but uh, I made a choice that uh, uh, produced a lot of suspended chords. So it sounds a little bit strange, but interesting. And here comes uh, the, 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 the program, or the, it could be written in any programming language, actually. Or, yeah. I made a, a manual way because that was faster than trying out everything. So I used uh, some tools and made it manually. But I say that if the G uh, R, which is uh, the difference or the rate, is strong negative, then the volume adjusted down. Uh, I haven't said uh, very much about how much. I just that should be some constant anywhere or somehow we have to decide what that means. But uh, this sentence means that we test on the GR and uh, see if it's uh, in the, the interval for strong negative. Then we adjust the volume by calling a routine or a subroutine procedure, what we call it, to, to do this uh, adjusting of the volume. And we have then uh, three possible, uh, we just adjust up or down and or we keep it. Uh, here is uh, the rules for, um, yeah, this is for the melody. And uh, there I have uh, done it a little bit different. Just to, just to try out uh, some possibilities. So there I check the, the green uh, intensity, absolute intensity. And I, I test if it's in, uh, in uh, intervals, and then I decide which tone to play. So um, that's if G is less than 32, uh, I have measured that value, uh, then I set the tone to D. And then it comes to, uh, yeah, and here we have the whole Dorian scale from D, D to D. But you had F there, right? Pardon? In the last uh, slide you had F, which is 
uh, isn't that the, um, A, B, C, the third in uh, D Dorian? Let me see. Uh, it's uh, there. You have a D E F G, mm. and then you have A and B and C. But you said you didn't use the third. Yeah, yeah, but that in the chord. This comes in addition, uh, he, and here this okay. will uh, produce different uh, uh, part of the chord. Okay. If you regard the melody as part of the chord all the time as just musicians do, music, then then you can um, add this to the chord, and then uh, you will have uh, maybe a minor chord or a major chord. Or if you have uh, F in D, then you have a minor uh, chord. Yes. So if you have ninety six. If G is 96, yeah. well, then you have a minor yeah. chord. Yeah, that's right. So the, the melody will uh, contribute to the chord. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> and here I have another type of rule. Uh, here I actually, I draw a number from a, what is called a uniform distribution. That means uh, I... Um, I draw a number between 0 and 1, and all values are equally likely when I draw like this. And then I test on this uh, drawn value, the probability, the prob, which is called, and I select the rhythm pattern for the melody up from this. So that means I have a quarter that is dumb, or, and then I, with a lower probability, I have a dumb, da, da. And uh, the last one is. Uh, for da, 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 like this. So um, this could uh, make an interesting melody. Let's uh, see. Yeah, and here I also draw uh, two similar drawing for it, for selecting the chord. And uh, we see that uh, the D is the most popular, and uh, then comes G, and uh, A is less popular. Now actually G is the less, uh, least popular and A is between. So then this uh, decides, this rule decides what the melody should uh, sound like. Uh, this uh, I could have used, I didn't really use it, but it was uh, uh, a possibility to select uh, the volume of the drums individually independent of the other uh, instruments. Yeah, so uh, I have actually, I made a sort of a video out from several pictures of the Nidaro sculpture. And I produced uh, then uh, music out from these rules and out from the pictures I took from the, uh, the sculpture. So I, I used this phone to, uh, to record sound and uh, take images, no problem, <laughs> it works fine for that. Um, and I used the various, uh, this is uh, free of charge uh, software. <clears throat> I, I'm not sure I used it here from view 64 that for morphing if you want to, to destroy the image completely. Audacity for, for uh, sound, Muse score for uh, plugging in uh, notes. I used Octave for, uh, for measuring the, uh, the pixel intensities of the images. And I used uh, GIMP for uh, still images and Blender for editing the video. And this was run under Windows, Windows 10. Um, even if I did this manually, it could be fully automatic, of course. It's not too difficult to do it. So then we are uh, ready for running the video. So, um, yeah, maybe we can help you with that. So.
edges actually. I don't know why. So it's uh, oh, that's you have the uh, VLC player, here? yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I tried with my VLC, it worked fine, but you can also try the Windows uh, yes. option there. It might be that you should copy it from Also, questions? Yeah, well, then, uh, thanks for... Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's a question to, I guess, the first part where, uh, well, Robin kind of asked the question before in the break, but uh, uh, it's uh, question is, where do you kind of see, <clears throat> uh, like, mixed reality uh, compared to this environment that you are talking, this collaborative space? Uh, as is it kind of a competitor or is it uh, an, uh, something that could be mixed together somehow or uh, uh, well I, I don't really see any of those as competitors I see it as collaborators yeah. more. and uh, I think we can uh, all those uh, different uh, names they end up as uh, a lot of good ideas and uh, they may have found things that we didn't think of, and uh, so it's just to to meet and uh, study and uh, our works together and uh, get the best out of it. That's my. Uh, Do you think um, uh, you can make it more uh, uh, real or? In, uh, in, uh, without uh, wearing some uh, form of headset or uh, like uh, as we talk a lot about like immersion like to, to feel that you are immersed in the mm -hmm. space and you are yeah feeling that you are together uh, do you have any opinion on well I, I have uh, tried those and uh, uh, but uh, that was uh, some time ago so it was in the early development and uh, I felt that it was more unnatural than uh, if you have, uh, if you are quite, well, you probably need some microphone and thing, what I have here, mm. and maybe an, an earplug. But um, 
but I fe feel more natural when I am uh, in a room with other persons, uh, maybe, and uh, and uh, I can see others on, on the screen. I fe feel that it's more natural than uh, just having this uh, uh, head displays. And, uh, but that's my personal opinion. I think others could say the opposite. Yeah, I was thinking like related to sound also that when you are having like this VR, so you, you you are wearing a headset also, which you can play like binaural uh, sound on, like so it's easy to hear what where it comes from, and in this collaborative space, maybe you would have like a lot of speaker, uh, yeah, a lot of speakers around or hmm. to, to like. Yeah, maybe I didn't say it, but I thought of uh, having what we could call position sound, which is what you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, when uh, I see one person speaking there, then the sound should come from there. And yeah. The opposite. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's important, and it's especially important when you have uh, outdoor, big outdoor venues. I have been participating in something in uh, outside uh, the Nidaros Cathedral and Opera many years ago, and um, and there the, they uh, had microphones, and uh, there were some persons coming running, and I heard the sound from back. That was terrible. That was <laughs> wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you're right. That should be addressed. Uh, actually, I thought of that in this case that. Uh, if uh, if you on this very big uh, sculpture here uh, see something is happening on this side, you should have the sound from there as well. Yeah, and uh, it is of course possible. It's more difficult in small rooms, but out it's uh, easier. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Well, there is yeah. this thing, I mean, uh, re uh, addressing the sound issue and stuff like that, uh, being more realistic. I mean, there are several ways, I mean, several approaches to spatial sound, I mean, like immersive sound and stuff like that. Uh, first of all, uh, is there any particular uh, immersive uh, sound system that might you have in mind? Uh, second, is there any particular hardware that you might think might be more useful in this case. For example, there are these speakers from this company called, for example, there is this company called Magnapan, for example. Mm -hmm. It's just like ribbon speakers. They're just like, for example, like a piece of wood, for example, just standing there. Yeah. And it's kind of could be invisible, for example, to mm -hmm. just have this system. And they're really like uh, natural sounding, stuff like that. Uh, and if you, I mean, in particular, don't have anything in mind regarding the hardware. Um, is it possible? I mean, could it be an option to actually negotiate with companies to develop stuff to to be used? I mean, in order hmm. for your purposes. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, as you mentioned, there are a lot of uh, possibilities and solutions out there. Uh, a search on the net gives you uh, many, many uh, possibilities. Uh, when it comes to companies to develop, they, uh, they need to see the market. Uh, one of the problems uh, is that for, for arts and music, uh, the markets in many cases are too small, so they uh, don't want to put too many, much money in it. That was the answer they gave. That was both sound and vision from Cisco, for example. They said 200 milliseconds is a okay delay because uh, most of our customers are feel that's quite nice. But they understood that uh, in my cases uh, they couldn't uh, couldn't handle. But uh, those cases I had, uh, there were no, no market for that. So that was a problem, um, but if you uh, if you make a good application and get some money for uh, maybe partly research, partly development, and so you could engage some companies to participate in that. Or, but I think that the university have to take the leadership of uh, such projects. But it's certainly possible, but uh, not easy. 
And uh, often uh, what I have felt is uh, as uh, working behind the music, arts and technology, I fell behind two st stools. That has happened very often. So uh, they say to me, now this is technology, you go to another department <laughs> and the opposite. <laughs> So that, that's also one of the problems. Um, but uh, we could also see it as uh, possibilities, not problems. So that's a more uh, positive attitude. Okay. Okay. But uh, of course, um, uh, well, you can develop things in software on your PC and it uh, could be okay. But if you are going to produce very low delays, then uh, you need some specialized hardware and uh, it costs uh, a lot of millions of kroner uh, easily. So I worked with uh, developing hardware uh, many years ago and uh, so I know uh, I was a project leader for one project that was uh, at 20, uh, 30 years ago. It was about 30 million kroner project at that time, so you can multiply it by five or so now. Similar problem, program. So it's not uh, cheap to develop hardware. Uh, it's much more easy to use uh, free of charge uh, software, which I did for this project. Uh, I used to use Photoshop before, but uh, now I have to buy it, so then uh, I used uh, GIMP that is uh, quite okay, nearly the same, a little bit different, but it uh, can do the job. And same in Blender. Blender is actually quite advanced and steep learning curve, but uh, the video editing part of it is quite easy. So, in, and it's free of charge. Uh, yep. I have one question about the uh, projections that you're having on the PV cells. Mm -hmm. uh, how is it like just for there's, I mean, outsiders or is it also like visible from the inside of the space or how is it? Yeah, it could, it could be both, actually. Yeah. If you assume that uh, when it's sunny, then you produce electricity, then you have to point to the sun. But the inside then could be used for... Uh, uh, for uh, inside the uh, projections. But in, uh, in the evening or when the, there is no sun outside, you can use them freely for, uh, for the art. So there are, uh, and they, they could be posed uh, in the space uh, quite freely, not 300 and uh, yeah, maybe 180 degree degrees or so, could be possible. So that means in the night you can show uh, similar images as, as I had. Uh, or you could be black outside and inside you can have uh, nice... Uh, uh, the old people could uh, have, see a very nice uh, heaven with sun and everything. Yeah. Also in the night if they don't sleep. Yep. Would you have uh, birds and other animals and uh, uh, inside? This Why not? Place? Why like, not? Yeah. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Or just the sounds. Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you could uh, even have some uh, birds that can sing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually um, saw uh, it was in Italy sometime. Uh, an orchestra was playing outside, and uh, then a lady came by with a with a dog, and the dog stopped. That started making sounds to the music. It was quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we could also uh, have some uh, something like that. Yeah, and the sounds uh, will they be playing only inside the building, or would be like uh, out in the environment as well? You could also have outside, but then you should be a little bit careful, maybe. Um, uh, if it's too much, it could be regarded as noise rather than music or and they sound uh, arts. So, and uh, also inside, of course, when uh, the uh, elderly are supposed to sleep, they don't want to have too much music, maybe. So it should be be used with care. Yeah. Uh, if you would go about to test this sound system, 
uh, how, how would you do it to get feedback from people living there or outside? Uh, you think of my case here? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Case. yeah. Well, uh, it was uh, a little bit random, this actually. So I, I uh, wondered, uh, probably as much as you, how this would sound like. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but uh, after some experience, you can change, um, for example, if you want to have a different uh, numbers drawn, uh, then you can change what is called a seed for, for this uh, procedure. And uh, then if you change the seed, then we get different uh, sounds all the time. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, have an infinite number of, uh, of different melodies out from this. <laughs> and uh, maybe you can uh, get some experience from it and listen and see what, uh, what, what uh, is it interesting or, or not. Mm. It sounds a little bit strange, I must admit that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, the first experiment and I said, let it be. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, giving us a sense of future and uh, we might uh, can collaborate in the project mm -hmm. Yes, I uh, appreciate very much to be here and uh, telling about my thoughts and, and not least see what you have done here and what you have tried to obtain that's very interesting, I like that Thank you